this is an introduction to relief sculpture and cardboard art, which is going to be our next project. So we've already been working in this class for a year. Uh, you already know a lot of things about what sculpture is. Uh, you have your own opinions about it. We've been working specifically in clay. We did uh, paper sculptures at the beginning of the year where you had to take a shape, a flat shape out of paper, create a form. Um, we've done a lot of different things. So you have some ideas of what sculpture is. Uh, the sculpture on the left is made of glass and cement, and the sculpture on the right is made of sand. I uh, don't know if you guys have been to any sand competitions, but I've been to some amazing ones, and I've even part participated in some sand sculpture competitions. Um, what does it mean to be 3D? So 3D means three-dimensional. Uh, so if you are doing a painting, for example, we consider it two-dimensional. It has a height to it and it has a width to it. Uh, 3D means it has thickness as well. Now, technically, a painting does have a thickness, but it's minimal, so you don't really count it. What do you think is the meaning of this sculpture? Take a look at it. What do you see? The title is Love. Do you think a two-dimensional version of this piece would be as powerful? So this is what the artist's intention was, and in, you can see in the dark, it glows. It demonstrates a conflict between a man and a woman, as well as the outer and inner expression of human nature. Their inner selves are executed in the form of a transparent child who are holding out their hands through the grating. As it's getting dark, the children start to shine. The shining is a symbol of purity and sincerity that brings people together and gives a chance of making up when the dark times arrive. A lot of times there is more meaning behind a work of art or specifically a sculpture than you first see. The next thing we wanna talk about is relief sculptures. How are the sculptures on the left different from the ones on the right? Take a look. So over here, we see the image is just sticking off of a flat surface a little bit. We have a flat surface here. It's popping up more. Flat surface here. This is flatter, kind of similar to that. This, you still have a flat surface back there, but it pops up. And if your screen's big enough to see, some of the images kind of melt into the background. And then this one, again, we have it popping up and we have the flat background. Here, there's basically no flat background. We have just the image and you would be able to walk completely around the image to see what the object is. So the sculptures on the left are called relief sculptures. They pop off of a flat surface. What you're going to do in this project after some practice is create a relief of a famous painting. And I will give you painting examples to choose from. If you don't like any of the samples I give, you can choose your own, but uh, there will be a ton of examples. So don't worry about picking anything right now. So this is called the Great Wave over um, great wave of Ma Mount Kanagawa, something like that. And this is someone who has created it in cardboard and they decided to paint it. You will not have to paint yours. So this is Van Gogh's bedroom and you can see how they have recreated it. I love how they peeled away some of the top layer of the cardboard to get that old weathered look to the walls. I think that's brilliant. I also love how sticking off of the fat, flat background, things really pop out. And this kind of like breaks the fourth wall, so to speak. Uh, 
really cool sticking outside of the rest of the rectangle. Uh, this one's by, this painting's by Andrew Wyeth, very famous painting again. And you can see again that they use some of the cardboard interior, the corrugation to get the grass texture here and then cut out the itty bitty little uh, house and barn and even gave texture to the clothing and the hair on the woman. This is Sunday afternoon on the island of the, the Isle of the Grand Yacht. It's the original title is actually in French, I believe, but I'm not going to bother translating that. Uh, I mean, I'm just giving you the translating. I'm not going to try to pronounce it. Uh, and you can see all the detail that somebody built up with this. Uh, this one, I think, is really fascinating how for the objects closest to you in the picture, what we call the foreground, they've used multiple layers of cardboard to make it pop out and be closer to you. And also the tree texture is kind of like torn shredded cardboard. This one is a lot of work. <laughs> Somebody spent a lot of time doing this. It's beautiful. And here are more examples of, of relief sculptures. Just take a moment and take a peek try to guess how they made some of the different textures, different shapes, etc. We have the one that's painted here, gives you a focal point, someplace for your eye to rest. Okay, now some examples that students have made. So the original picture is down here, and then the recreation is up here. Some more successful than others. You be the judge. What works best? Why do some of these not work as well? For instance, this, what do you see in there that may not be as good, for example, as this? So my eye goes to some places in the cardboard that are broken, like kind of snapped. So you get those extra wrinkles uh, also, there may be a little bit of a cutting issue here where the lines aren't perfectly straight. There's some messiness to the cardboard that doesn't really fit with the picture. It would be different if they kind of dug away some areas that represented clouds or something. Uh, this is another thing you could do if you had a messy area of the cardboard. Cover it, cover it with torn pieces. You could make some clouds out of torn pieces. Okay, uh, this is um, about a little girl um, being escorted to school um, back in the 60s when um, these racial lines were drawn and you had the schools that were segregated. You had the white schools and then you had the black schools. And this was one of the first little girls to actually be um like they said the white school had to accept her. So this is the men in the suits escorting her to school. And I love how the little white dress is the only part that uses anything other than brown. Um, it kind of represents how clean and innocent the little girl is in all of this. Imagine yourself having to be escorted into a school and what your experience would have been that first day um, from teachers, from other students, etc. cetera, um, in that time back in the 60s. Okay, here is a uh, Mexican artist, Diego Rivera, and uh, you can see how all the layering. I love how they just cut through the cardboard and kind of pressed in with something. You can do that like cut and then press in with a pen or something to get the division between the flower stems here. They took time to do some layering in the cloth. Now they don't have as many layers as here, but you get the idea. You can simplify to some extent with this project. Just don't simplify so much that you can't tell what it is anymore. And this is a famous surreal painting with the apple in front of the guy's face. I love how they chose a different color for the buttons and the shirt back there just to make them pop out. 
This one looks like another surreal art. I am not familiar with it. I don't know who the artist was. Uh, I love how they did the floorboard texture. It's really cool how they, you have the corrugation running this way and then the extra details added on top. The puffy little clouds. They did a good job of stacking up all the details. And they even got this detail of the molding at the top of the room. So in order to do this project, you have to figure out how to create depth in an artwork. And in order to figure that out, you have to figure out how to evaluate the depth in the artwork. Question, what is the furthest thing from us in this artwork? Just take a look. What's the furthest away? How can we tell that that thing is the furthest away? Well, so furthest away, you might say the water or the mountains over here. So if you said the water, one way we can tell it's the furthest away is there's other objects overlapping, right? You've got this overlapping, you have this, you have the tree overlapping. Um, if you had said the mountains, um, because you know the size of mountains and they're very tiny, also because the water is at the same level, same layer as the mountain, the overlapping here kind of counts for that part. You know that this object has to be closer to you because it's covering some of the things in that same layer. How can we differentiate objects when they are one color? So here you would say that this is kind of a beige or brown. You still have lights and darks and shadows. Uh, you can create shadows when you do your cardboard sculpture by layering and stacking things. This painting, what is closest to you? And the things that are closest to you, how can you tell they're closest? So these couple of girls and these two here are very close. And again, you see overlapping. So this girl is maybe slightly in front of that girl, her hand, because it overlaps a tiny bit. Um, also, this skirt seems to stick out a little further than that, that one. Another way to tell is it's kind of lower in the picture. And then this girl, her hand overlaps that one. So she has to be in front of this girl, right? And then they overlap that one <laughs> and then back to that one, etc. So uh, overlapping is a good clue. Also, closer to the bottom of the picture. Right? You can see as things get further away, they tend to be higher in the picture. Uh, color and details. So this girl, if you look at the flowers, they're very bright colors. They really pop and you can see all the little details in there. Versus this guy back here, you can't really see much of the detail, for instance, in his clothing or in the steps or in the picture back there. And it gets blurry as it gets further away. Uh, also, the colors get duller. Right. The color back here on his flesh is not quite as bright as some of the flesh up in the front, the foreground. Every picture contains three horizons of vision. Now, I don't know if I would say every picture, <laughs> but most pictures you can pick, you can pick out layering, um, especially in a photograph. So you have the whole picture. Imagine um, looking out your window outside and there's going to be layering of details that you see there. So foreground is the closest to you. Four is front. Midground has the word middle in it, right? So it's going to be the mid level and then background has back in it. So you know it's the stuff behind everything else. So you will need to know these terms background, midground, and foreground. So a relief sculpture, can you think of something that has a relief sculpture on it? It asks you something you might have in your pocket, something you might have in your wallet or your backpack, 
or maybe stuck in a couch in the, between the cushions. <laughs> so a coin is an example of a relief sculpture. Think of the eagle on a quarter where it pops off the background. There you go. Here are other relief sculptures, right? You have a flat background, even if it's the wall behind it and it pops off, you can't walk around a relief sculpture. You won't find anything interesting on the back of it. Okay, this is a very famous painting. You probably are very familiar with it. The Starry Night by Vincent van Gogh. Take a look at it. And we're gonna look at the three layers in this painting. So you have a sky back here and mountains. You have a little village uh, down below, and then you have a cypress tree up close. So in this, you have the background being the, the night, the starry night with all those swirls. And then they're counting the mid ground, the middle ground as the mountains and the little village in here which is the green here. And then the foreground being the cypress tree. So foreground, middle ground, background. Take a look at these pictures. I want you to identify the foreground, middle ground, and background of each. What do you think? So foreground, if you said the rocks, absolutely. And then what's behind the rocks? Well, you don't know if this should count as a foreground or a middle ground, but definitely these have a mid layer to them. And then all of this sky, clouds, that back mountain, I would count the background. Here, foreground, what's in the front? This guy, middle ground. It's not the middle of the picture here, and possibly here, middle ground objects, and then background, all the tiny stuff back there. What do you think about this one? What are the major three layers? Let's start with the background. If you're thinking sky and trees back here, I think you'd be correct. What's in the foreground? What's in the front? So the people, I would include the pitchfork there. I mean, you could say there's four layers, but it, for the most part, I would say this is all foreground. And then what's left? You've got the middle ground, the house, and the little barn there. What's in the very back? I would say the sky and these background, these uh, really dark buildings here. What's in the foreground? What's in the very front? So definitely this. Maybe you could make some of these tables the foreground and then middle ground, the things that are left. The Andrew Wyeth painting. What's in the very front? Pretty obvious, right? The girl. Mid, all this grass texture and background. House and barn. Pretty easy. You just have to stop for a moment and analyze it. background, including, I would say, the house and the barn, middle ground, the green grass, foreground, the girl. To review, three main layers in artwork that help show depth. What are they? What's the front one? What's the one right in the middle? And then what's the one behind everything? Just like that. Okay, and then there are four techniques uh, to create depth that I've kind of gone over, um, but this illustrates it very clearly overlapping. So one thing covers part of another. The thing that's covered is going to be the thing behind. Placement. 
So notice, even though these are all drawn and shaded the same, it looks like this is closer to you, even though there's no overlapping. That's kind of cool. So the things higher in the picture usually appear further away. The things lower usually, usually appear closer, unless there's some overlapping or something else that uh, points to a different analysis. And size, things that are bigger are generally going to be closer to you. Things, you know, if it's the same object and it's smaller, it's going to look further away. And then linear perspective. My thing here is covering. I can't move it out of the way get rid of my picture there. Okay, linear perspective. So um, using vanishing points, if you know how to do that already. And then um, it asks here, why won't the other two techniques work with what we are doing? Why not shading? Think about it, we're going to be making this out of cardboard. So unless you're going to paint it, you don't have much of a way of shading the cardboard value and focus. So things that are further away from you, I mentioned earlier, uh, are a bit fuzzy, a bit out of focus. Um, and we're not going to be able to do that very well with cardboard because you'll be cutting the edges of everything. Okay, so we're going to skip that one. Okay, you're going to do a relief practice example. You're going to focus on one of the four images I give you. You're going to figure out which parts the foreground, what's the middle ground, and what's the background. And you're going to replicate just the basic idea of each section. You don't have to focus too much on accuracy of the drawing right now. This is just a pack practice. And even though the examples are shown in cardboard, I'm going to have you do these just out of some paper that I give you in class or that you have at home. So one of the projects you can do is Van Gogh's Starry Night. You're going to figure out what's the foreground, what's the middle ground, what's the background. It actually shows it there for you. Or you can use this one, or this one, or this one. Just make sure you can figure out foreground, middle ground, and background in whichever one you choose. Okay, so you are going to get three pieces of paper. You're um, all the same size. You're going to draw out each ground, each level, right, on the pieces of paper. So background, notice on this one, it's just going to be flat. They don't have anything on it. What's going in your middle ground and what's going in your foreground. Then for this practice, you're going to use a uh, just a pair of scissors to cut them out, right? That's why we're using separate pieces of paper. Background, they just kept as a rectangle. Middle ground, they had to do this detail, but kept the rectangle on the bottom. And then foreground, right? Details, rectangle on the bottom. And then you're going to neatly stack them on top of each other and glue them down. If you uh, want to use different uh, colors or different values of the paper, I think that would be a good idea um, since paper is not very thick. They, the layers may not show up very well if you use all the same color. And here is um, a grading rubric. So you created a relief out of four choices of artworks. You included the majority of each ground, foreground, middle ground, and background. You carefully cut out along the contours of the main shapes. You neatly glued and positioned the grounds where they should be. And you added the major details within the piece. This is how that one came out. And here's theirs for this one. And it shows what they cut for each ground. Next time we'll look at creating texture with cardboard.